Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. We're thankful to be in the service again this evening. We're glad to see each one that's here. Leviticus chapter 10. We're going to just read just a few verses here, and probably all of you are familiar with the account we're going to look at. We're going to look at, for just a moment, uh, the situation that took place between Nadab and Abihu, who were the sons of Aaron. They were the uh, priests before the Lord when the uh, tabernacle began, as they began to travel and began to set up the tabernacle and worship the Lord through the law. And Nadab and Abihu were... Uh, priest along with Aaron and as you know when you study that these priests it took a lot to keep these things going and to do all that was required of them in the law so there was obviously more than one priest and there was uh, obviously the high priest and uh, on into the law that began to rotate who would be the high priest uh, but you see something that took place here that it's kind of an odd odd account uh, and, and I want, we want to just look at maybe a couple of things about it. It just takes up about just a few verses here. I, I'm only going to read three. It goes down through uh, verse 7 and discussing this. And maybe maybe on a little bit further, but uh, just, just a few verses about this account. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses and Aaron, excuse me, then Moses said unto Aaron, this is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. I'm going to stop reading there in verse 3. So we see this situation that, that, that takes place here. These two men come in to, to do their job as priests, to come before the Lord, to offer incense before him. And they offer strange fire. What does that mean? I don't, I don't know exactly what it means. They offered something that God didn't command them to offer. I know that much. They brought something that was foreign. They brought something that God had not commanded them to, something different. And uh, they, were, they were coming with something a little bit different than what God had commanded And uh, it's important for us to, to make that distinction about it, I believe. And really, I don't know that you could maybe speculate a little bit more in there, but uh, probably do it damage to, to, to try to get a whole lot further than in, in there than just that. But to, to understand that these men brought something to the Lord that was not what was commanded. They came with something different. Now, I want you to make, there's kind of a connection here. I want you to see this connection because I'm going to take it and kind of bring it to where we're at today. There is a, a connection between the incense offered in the Old Testament and the prayers of the saints in the New Testament. It's a, it's a picture. The Old Testament incense was a, a picture of the prayers of the saints. You can see that in Revelation chapter 8. It's mentioned along that line that the prayers of the saints ro rose before the Lord. Uh, as you, you would see incense, the smoke of the incense do. And in quite a few other connections that are made there can give you verses to, to make that connection. And so we see that depicted. And it's, you, you almost get the sense of when you read this, you say, well, man, it doesn't seem like they did a whole lot wrong. And yet their lives were taken. They offered strange fire before the Lord, this, this incense before him, and their lives were taken because of it. So we want to take that for a moment and uh, look at just a couple of statements that, that was said here and how can we, what can we learn from that in our lives. So I, I want you to notice this, that it says that they offered strange fire before the Lord which commanded them not. See, they did something uh, that God had not commanded them to do. They brought something that God had not commanded them to do. And I think one of the questions that we have to ask is why did they do that? And that question will be answered in a moment. And there again, something we can look and learn about ourselves. 
and there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, is what the Bible tells us. And they died before the Lord. And Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake. I want you to notice that statement to begin with. This is that the Lord spake. In other words, Moses is, is showing Aaron that God told us about doing this. This is what the Lord told us about. This is what the Lord instructed us in. This is what the Lord said. And so he is reminding Aaron that God gave us specific commands and God had already commanded us concerning these things. In other words, they should have known better. That's kind of what he's saying. God already told us this, this thing. God already let us know they, these men should have known better. All right, so what do you see in here? What, one thing that I see is these men offered strange fire before the consuming fire. They were literally, they were coming into the presence of God. They were coming into this, the, the, the place to offer the incense to the Lord. They were coming into the holy place, into a place where they would, during the service of the Lord. By the way, I want you to go back through and think about the times that you see God referred to as fire in the scripture. He is a consuming fire. He came down on Mount Sinai in a burning smoke. Genesis 15 says that he was a smoking furnace. You see him depicted as a smoking furnace. Time and time again, you see God depicted in his wrath as fire coming out. The book of Psalms makes the statement that fire goes before him and before his throne is a fire that goes before him. And why, why is this the case? Why is God referred to in that manner? When the, when the children of Israel saw him come down on Mount Sinai, in the form in which God came, as this, the whole mountain quaked, the whole mountain smoked, and, and he spoke to them, and what they say? We're all familiar with it. They, in all words, they told Moses, don't, don't let him speak to us anymore. You speak to him. And God did that so that they would fear him. And you can see, obviously, with these men, there was a lack of fear of the Lord that was there. One of the things that we face as well in our society, there's a lack of fear of the Lord. And we need to, first we need to be sure that that's not the case in our own hearts, that we actually fear the Lord. We fear Him. And so these men offered this strange fire because they did not fear Him, which is something also connected to what I'm about to, what we're about to go in. So notice this in verse 3, And Moses said unto Aaron, This is that the Lord spake, saying, I want you to notice these next four words. This is that that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified. The Lord told him, I will be sanctified. What does the word sanctified mean? The word sanctified means separate. Separated. Holy. God is holy. Now I want you to notice, uh, it, it's easy to see within the context what God is saying. God's not saying, I'm going to be holy. I'm going to get there one day. I will be sanctified. I'm going I'm to get to the place of sanctification. What he's saying is that you will respect me as sanctified. You will see me as holy. I will be sanctified. Now that goes on. Let me continue that statement. He said, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. I will be holy to them that come to me. They will see me as such. That's what God is, is saying. That's what he's already spake. Moses is looking back on this. And he's showing him, Aaron that is, that one of the things that Nadab and Abihu did in doing this was they disrespected who God is. They did not treat him as sanctified. They did not treat him as holy. They treated him haphazardly and common. They brought in what they saw fit to bring in of their own accord, and they did not sanctify the Lord in their hearts first. And so this was their, this is the root of their failure. Now today we don't, literally come before the Lord 
In other words, this is not the temple. And yes, the Lord's here. But you think about that, that literally that was the place that God was to dwell on the earth. They would go into the Holy of Holies and God would be there. The, the, the high priest would go in into the presence of the Lord. And today that's not the case here. But does that mean that we are not coming to meet with the Lord? Does that then mean that because the Lord is not here, in other words, I've heard that idea used as a place where there's, there's no need to, to respect the Lord's house from that angle because it, the Lord's not here, but yet we are to respect the Lord's house, right? We're to be respectful to the Lord's house. We are, in fact, Paul goes as far, we'll look at this in a moment from a different angle, but he said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, that thou oughtest, you know, I'd come unto you, but he said, I've written unto you that you may know how to behave yourself in the house of the Lord, which is the house of the living God. And what Paul said, no, it, it's not the temple, it's not the place where God dwells that we come and that we come meet with him and we make the offerings and that kind of thing before him, but we do come to meet the Lord. This is a place where we come to worship the Lord. This is the place where we come to uh, the, the house of the living God. So I want you to turn with me for a moment to First Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I've mentioned this statement before. We, we all often look at the, the back side of this verse and kind of leave out the, the, the front portion of it. But I want you to notice that that first statement that's made in this verse, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Well, that's what Nadab and Abihu failed to do. They didn't sanctify him in their hearts. And that's what the Lord is, is telling them. I will be sanctified unto them that come unto me. They will see me as different. They will see me as holy. Now, what does holy mean? We are to, let me just read it. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. We are to be holy because God is holy. We understand that. How do you become holy? I'm afraid that a lot of times when you ask that question, what many people think, I can tell you this because that's what I used to think, what it, it, many people think that what holiness is is just don't do's. If you do the don't do's, then you'll become holy. Being holy is just not sinning. But that's not the case. Being holy is not just a list of don't do's. And then if we, we can get all those right, then we've become holy because we're not doing something. No, being holy is the character of God. God is holy, not just because God is sinless. God is holy because He is righteous. God is holy because He is love. God is holy because He is without error. God is holy because of all of the character. He can go on to, be, to describe who God is, that, that he is good and that he is merciful and that he is gracious. All of this having to do with the character of God. Being holy is a whole lot more than just being without sin. And I'm afraid that a lot of times when we're trying to become holy, that all we're trying to do is just become without sin by doing the don't do's. But the true pursuit of holiness is to become like God. 
But to become like him, we have to see him for who he is. He's got to be sanctified in our hearts. And we need to sanctify him here. What was Nadab and Abihu's place? They did not sanctify the Lord in their hearts. Now let me back up for a moment. When you think of God, who do you think of him to be? With a lot of things that we face when we're discussing Bible topics, you're going to find that there are, in a lot of schools of thought, there are poles on either side. There's always, with any particular school of thought, there's always extremes. When you discuss choices, there's always extremes. There's the middle of the ground. On one end, there's Arminianism, which is the complete free will of men. We discussed this a few moments ago. And then there is Calvinism, which means the complete sovereignty of God. Man has no free will, in other words. Those are the two poles, the extremes. It's kind of like a road with two ditches, one on either side. The middle of the ground is that free will exists and the sovereignty of God exists at the same time. And so you see both things at the same time. You say, well, that's more than I can understand. Well, absolutely it is. Oftentimes that's the case. When you look at the Lord, if we're not careful, we can find ourselves in two, two ends of a, a completely different spectrum. But it's important that we maintain a, a degree of moderation that we find ourselves in the middle. Let me go back for a moment and mention a couple of things. When you think of relationship with God, it's very beneficial to look at God as our Father. It's a wonderful thing to see Him because He has given us the Spirit of Christ through which we cry, Abba, Father. He is our Heavenly Father. And that the word Abba, we use as a, 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 a father, but it's a very intimate term that is used to describe this relationship of an earthly son and an earthly father and the closeness and the intimacy of the relationship that they have together. And so it's important that we see God's love from that angle. And we see God's mercy and his care for us from that angle because God is a God that cares. And he is a God that is a personal God. And he is a God that is concerned about us individually. And he is a God that I am important to. And he loves me. And his care for me is great. I'm important to him. And it's important for us to see that. And we see that, that idea laid out through the scriptures. And it's something that we've been called attention to for a long period of time. Matthew chapter 7. You don't have to turn there. Matthew chapter 7 verse 11. Uh, he's speaking about the gifts that the Father gives. Jesus is the one who is speaking here. And he makes a statement that is you, if, if you as earthly fathers know how to give your children good gifts, how much more then does our heavenly Father know how to give gifts unto his children? The point that Jesus is making is that from this relationship with God being our heavenly Father, knowing us to the degree that he does far better than we even know ourselves, do then he does then he not know how to give us a gift? No. God knows how to give us gifts far better than we can even give our own children. God knows exactly what we need. And so Jesus is using this relationship with him being our heavenly father to encourage us in the fact that God knows how to take care of us. He knows how to give us gifts. He knows how to give us what we pray for. And there's often times that we pray and we ask God for something. Again, you get this incense. There's often times we pray and we ask God for something and God doesn't give us that, but rather he gives us something else that's far greater. 
than what we originally wanted. Hebrews chapter 12 defines and kind of describes God from, again, this angle of a father who would chasten his children. And that's very comforting because God's chastening is not from the angle of a vengeful, wrath-filled God. It's from the angle of a father and his son. Sometimes we tend to not always find ourselves in the middle of the road. How many times did you just think about it, to y- y'all older ones, and I'll let you put yourself in that category if you want to. How many of you, if you heard preaching 40, 50 years ago, heard the Lord preached as a heavenly father who was compassionate, loving? Those messages were few and far between, and at least in the churches that I grew up in. God was a consuming fire. Almost to the degree that you looked over your shoulder with everything that you did because you were scared to death that God was going to drop the hammer on you. And somewhere along the way, we've kind of, we've, we've erred. We've gotten off too, too far to one side and We've left out the idea, and God, yes, God is a consuming fire, but we've left out the idea that we are his children, and and he is our heavenly father, and and we've got to understand that. We've got to remind ourselves of that. But if we're not careful, on the other side of that, we can just think of God as our father, and he's, he's just our father, you know. And we fail to see him for who he really is. He's God. And the Lord said, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. Today it is very true that God is our heavenly father. And that he loves us, if you're saved, as his children. And he loves you if you're lost and wants you to be his child. He wants you to be saved. But it's also true that God is a consuming fire. And that we must, must reverence him. Why? It affects everything that we do. Do you know that how you present yourself to the world? I mentioned the other day about modesty and dress. How you dress depicts who you are believe God to be in your heart. How you present yourself at church. Now again, I want you to understand, there's no law in the New Testament that says you're supposed to wear a three-piece suit to church. It's not there. There's there's no guidance as, as that you've got to do this and this and dress this specific way and, and, and that... That's not, that's not, the Bible doesn't do that. But there again, if God is sanctified in your heart, you're going to, you're going to treat him as such. In other words, that this is Sunday. We're not going in just anywhere. We're going to the house of the Lord. We're going to meet with God. We're going to meet with the consuming fire. We're going to meet with the Lord, our Father, which art in heaven. What is that a reminder of? It reminds us of his position that that he is in heaven and, and we on earth. We're coming to seek him. We come to call on him. We come to Ask him to to meet with us, to be with us in the service. And that's that's what we often do. The question is, is he sanctified in our heart? In what way have we come before him? Have we come before him in in just a common manner? The pursuit of holiness, again, is not 
just trying to become sinless, but a recognition of the sanctity and the sanctification of God and becoming like him. Be ye holy for I am holy. Becoming like God. There's a word here I want to use. Look at, let's turn to Acts chapter 10 real quick before we close. Acts chapter 10. This is a very interesting very interesting piece of scripture. The Lord is showing Peter some things that he's preparing him to go to speak to Cornelius is what he's doing. And I'm not it's it, it's to me it's there's a degree of humor that's almost here when you read this. Because when Peter goes to preach to Cornelius, if you, if you read it and, and the way it's written, you can almost text, detect a sense of unsurety in the way Peter's preaching. It's almost like he's really not sure what he's doing there. And he's really not sure why he's preaching to these people. But as he preaches... All these folks get saved and he witnesses it. But God is showing him with this sheet that's let down and all of these beasts that are on it that God can cleanse whoever he decides to cleanse because he's God. And so he, as he lets it down and Peter sees this vision and God tells him, uh, arise and, and Peter kill and eat. You see that verse 13 there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have not never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The word common is, means it's defiled. I, I've never eaten anything. It's what Peter said, I've never eaten anything common. And again, a voice speaking to him again the second time. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou Common. In other words, there is nothing that God's ever cleansed that's defiled because he's God. And you don't call God or you don't call anything that God's done common because God hadn't done anything common. God is not common. And you can see Peter and what he's saying is, no, Lord, I'm not going to eat that stuff. I'm set apart. And God's telling him, no, I'm set apart. I'm the one that's different. I will be sanctified in the heart of them that come nigh me. You better recognize that you're defiled and I'm the one that's different. I'm the one that's holy. And that's why it's important for us to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. Because until we learn to see him as holy, then how in the world are we ever going to become holy? Part of the process of becoming holy is learning who he is. I'm afraid that we've allowed ourselves to look at God so much from just the fatherly aspect that we've allowed God to become common to us. But we must sanctify the Lord God in our hearts. We must see him for who he is and that he is holy. I want to give you one more verse. If you were here for Ecclesiastes chapter 5, if you were here for a revival Friday night, you probably remember this verse. Brother Joe mentioned it. I love this particular verse. It reminds us of the, the uh, degree of separation between us and God. Verse 1, 
Look, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. He says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. And be more ready to hear. Be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. Now that's just another way of saying speaking. Be ready to hear more than you're ready to talk. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. Why? Because God is not common. God is not like us. God is not defiled. God is holy. God is sanctified. And he said, for God is in heaven and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. Today, it's important for us not only to see God as our heavenly father. And not to just see God as a consuming fire. But to see him accurately. And that he is both. He is our heavenly father. And he is a consuming fire. And he will be sanctified. And it is vitally important for us as we grow to sanctify him in our hearts and to see the holiness of God and how that he is set apart and that we should be set apart too by becoming like him and by being like him while we have a verse of a song.